The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the laws of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Today's sermon is, is uh, kind of like a part two to last week. Um, didn't intend for it to be a two-part sermon, but uh, so if you weren't here this past weekend, you can find the sermon online at aplc.org. Uh, you'll see the sermon snippet there to, to watch to, to find out what we talked about there. Um, and I'm going to get into some of the things we talked about last week, but first, today's sermon really has much more to do with one word, and that's righteousness. Righteousness, or being Righteous. In today's language, how we use that word righteous, what does it mean? What would be a good working definition for us to say righteous means? I've asked two other church services, and they both come up with kind of the same thing, but what about y'all? What does it mean today? Say it again. Be good? I think that's a really great definition, right? If you're righteous, you're good. I, do good to others? I heard somebody say a uh, right way of living. And... and I tend to think of it in today's language kind of like, I'm doing good. I I pay my taxes. I go to church. I, I, you know, uh, mow the lawn. You know, I take care of my kids. You know, I wash my car. You know, I do all these things. Check, 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 check. But at the end of the day, when I start thinking about it, that's all about me, making sure I'm okay. Because it's almost like a fear response because I'm afraid of what if I'm not. Righteous in the Bible, the righteousness in the Bible is about a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. So whenever you see that word listed in the Bible or used in the Bible, and we're going to hear it multiple times today, it talks about the right relationship with God and with each other. Last week we talked uh, uh, in Micah and in in the gospel about um, uh, all the different... Beatitudes that Jesus says and the blessings, and that that word blessing is really about this divine proximity, the closeness that we have to God is being blessed. Today, righteousness is how we respond to recognizing that, okay? So Jewish people throughout history have wanted to become righteous. They have a strong hope to be righteous. Most of the scriptures that you read, most of the stories in the Old Testament are, are, are generated and, and, and focused on becoming righteous. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, they're evicted from the garden because they're not in a right relationship anymore with God. You go on to Noah. Noah was the only righteous person that God could find to start the world over again. And then even God determines that creation itself is righteous and promises never to do it again. Abraham was a righteous man to father an entire nation. Moses argues with God on the mountain to remember your righteousness, to not destroy the people in the wilderness because they're turning away from you. And then God gives, of course, the Ten Commandments to Moses, and all Ten Commandments have to deal with what? Relationships. The first three are about our relationship with God. The last seven are about our relationship with each other, that right relationship about becoming righteous. And then you have the prophets that come into play. And the prophets remind the people, like Micah last week was reminding the people, that there's danger out there because we're turning away from God. Do you remember the cycle that we talked about? 
how people would start to turn away from God, they'd start turning toward themselves, and then all of a sudden they'd find themselves in some sort of calamity or slavery or oppression or, or exile, and then they would hear the word of a prophet or a king or a judge, and they would turn back toward God, back into that right relationship, and they would be restored for a time until they started turning back to themselves. And that cycle would happen. So Micah is telling the people to practice justice and, and love kindness and walk humbly. That's the way of being righteous with each other. Isaiah is talking to the people after the exile. Isaiah is the lesson that we have today from the Old Testament. And the people are returning back. They're being restored. Finally coming back to their homeland. And Isaiah is recognizing that they're beginning to cycle anew because while they're worshiping God, they're treating people unjustly. And he's calling them to righteousness. He talks about a righteous community is like the light that breaks forth. It illuminates everything. And the neat thing about light and darkness is that the light does the work. We don't do the work. The light dispels the darkness. We don't dispel the darkness. The light shines through our righteousness to dispel the darkness, Isaiah is telling the people. And he says, and if a community is practicing this, and if a community is trying to be closer to God and closer to this relationship with God, this right relationship, they will free the oppressed. They will liberate them. They will feed the hungry. They will clothe the naked. They will shelter the homeless. These are responses to that right relationship. And through that comes healing. And the light that can be seen from e to everywhere is like that light that breaks forth at the dawn. Think about a sunrise. You ever been on the beach and watched the sun come up? It's something to see, isn't it? All of a sudden on the horizon, that first little glimmer, and it's just beaming everywhere. And it touches everything. And it's warm. And it's an experience to behold. Isaiah is looking at the people saying, that's what happens when we're treating each other in this right relationship, in this righteous way, in this way that lets them see the closeness of God is within me. So now Jesus is going to use this concept of light when he's talking to the disciples today. But before we get to that, we have to remember where he was. Today's lesson is the next thing after last week's. So what we read last week about all the blessings... This is the next thing that happens. So let's remember that Jesus is reminding these people about the close proximity of the divine that's within them right now. And the way that we experience this close proximity is by being humble, by being pure in spirit, by being peaceful and merciful. And then, of course, Jesus says those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're hungry for that right relationship. So everything that we do should, be, uh, should show the God that's in me to the God that's in you. We should be experiencing this together. In other words, Jesus is saying, let's not continue this pattern of, of this cycle. Let's break the cycle and let's stop going round and round in circles and just recognize that right now, God is within you and everything you do is a response to God in you and that is righteousness. And that's whenever Jesus says in our lesson today, you are salt you are the light. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And by the way, for any English majors out there, he's using the plural of you. So like a good Texan, Jesus would say, y'all are salt. Y'all are light, which means all y'all. It's already there. You already have it. You can't escape it. It's within you. You can choose not to share it, of course, but it's there. It's already there. So what does he mean by salt? What does he mean by light? Okay, so how do we use salt today? Simple, right? What do we use it for? Preserve things? Anybody have table salt on their table at home? You ever go to a restaurant and you order a steak and you put a little salt on that steak? My dad would say no, but we do. We do that every once in a while. Does it change the steak when you put salt on it? It's still the steak, right? Sea salt is one, yes. We use sea salt as well. The steak doesn't change. What changes? The flavor, the experience that you have with it. It's still a slab of meat. If you have a baked potato, you put salt on it, it doesn't change the baked potato. It changes your experience with that baked potato. A firework uses salt to create color. It does not change the combustible material that explodes. It changes the experience that we have with it. So in other words, salt has the ability to change the experience. So Jesus is saying, I can't change you, 
but our experience can definitely be different. And I can treat you like God is in you with the God that's in me. And maybe that experience will be different. And I can be salt. Then he talks about light. If you go into a room and the lights are off and you flick the switch, what happens? The lights come on. Does the room change? No, it's still the same old room. But you're experiencing it different. If we were in here and the lights went down, you might be able to see a little bit differently. Light just changes the experience. Jesus says, be the light. You are the light. Let the divine in you be expressed out into the world and share that light with others in everything that you say and everything that you do. That is righteous. That is a right way of living with God and being in that relationship and with each other. And it's incredibly hard for us to do, isn't it? It's hard sometimes to be that way. So then Jesus says, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God. In other words, everything that you do should just be screaming God's love for the other person. So they have no other way of seeing anything except God beaming through you. And thus you change the experience. I don't know if I can change a single person in here, but I know when I'm treating others that way, I change. I change. The light changes me. The salt changes me. So then Jesus puts it back into the world of righteousness, and he brings it back at the very end, and he says, unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what first seems like kind of a threat, like, oh my gosh, I better get this right, it's not what it is at all. It's not about legalism. It's not about how much you do right or wrong. It's participating in this light and in this salt, because at the time, the Pharisees were caught up in that cycle. And they were turning away from God. They were turning on themselves. They were taking from the widows. They were taking from the orphans. They were stealing people's houses. They were doing things that the church wasn't supposed to be doing. And he's pointing out the cycle that's about to happen for them. And they are doomed. They're going to find enslavement. They're going to find problems. They're going to find all kinds of things. And maybe someday a prophet will speak and they'll hear. But we can break that cycle right now by living in this right relationship with God to recognize that I am the closest that I'm ever going to get to the divine right now. Because God is within each and every one of us. So Jesus challenges us, be the salt, be the light, for you are the salt, you are the light. And let your light shine before others that they can't help but see God beaming through you.